caller want to actually come up with what he is intending to do um so basically the whole talk is geared towards that the first process is suppose a student comes to me and says uh, right now uh, let's say uh, queer theory is in vogue so i would like to work on it so my question would be where are you going to look at i mean are you studying novels studying uh, movies or something else so the question is have you selected the talk text are you sure what i mean looked at a particular kind of text is it going to be local like index british american or are you have you already decided that i am going to look at queer theory i am going to come to this particular conclusion and now you will start searching for texts so this is the kind of uh, concern that leads to the th abuse of theory so how will a student given within the restrictions of a university they will have deadlines to meet uh, perhaps they have to finish their proposal within a year and a half uh, write the thesis of the 3 4 years how will they finish so this particular change this altering this hierarchy like for instance uh, looking for the texts first deciding what we are working on first reading them and of course then you have the secondary literature to to read the lacuna in the existing literature will emerge from there so the theory that you would need will automatically emerge in the process it wouldn't need more time just because we are reversing the order all i'm suggesting is if students are coming to us and saying i want to work on this theory unless they are working on the theory itself unless they are contributing which would basically be a philosophical work unless they are doing that unless if they want to do a literary analysis then this order has to be dissuaded students should be encouraged not to decide the theory even before they have read the texts or chosen the text for that matter uh, does it answer your question actually sir thank you so much okay uh, all right now uh, this is the second point i was trying to make about the abuse of theory apart from the jargon and let's go to the next one so then the question is if you're talking about theory there is often a lot of because we all understand what theory is but we also don't in some ways there's always a lot of you know like lacuna in in what it actually means so let's go to the root of it so ray williams has a classic book called keywords where he lists out the major keywords used in the humanities and social sciences so he says there are four different senses of the word theory which were in circulation by the 17th century number one interestingly is a spectacle theory is a contemplated sight it is also a scheme of ideas and an explanatory scheme so it's the fourth one that has now become more prominent the last two of course yeah distinguished from practice theory seeks to explain concepts if a theory were open to no objection it would cease to be a theory and would become a law and here i have to mention that the usage of the term in humanities is quite different from that in the pure sciences so you know in a pure science theory is um, is something you start with it's not it's not proven whereas for us we sort of arrive at a theory at the end of our research now theoria which is the original greek term meant a sense of witnessing to witness speculation and meditative life being the highest form of human activity uh therefore tracing it to the roots thea means sight theoros is the spectator and theoren is to observe carefully theory therefore is very closely associated with spectacle and bearing witness now it is curious how this vernacular sense of theoria as a civic witnessing watching and observing um is altered by the 4th century bce to mean a sense of attentive reflection or meditation and from the greek sense it has now come closer to what is understood as contemplatio in latin echoing the end of a new practice of thought as well as a new mode of life called faint philosophy also seeks to transform the self so therefore what has happened now is from the original idea of theory as to look this contemplative theory has now become an inward looking looking inside to transform the self 
It's driven by ethical dissatisfaction and existential dilemmas. In other words, a sense of meditation has now entered the picture. In the 18th century, theory emerges as a term of mediation between the senses and reason. What uh, Immanuel Kant would call his uh, synthetic and analytic a priori. So, and it was of course used to study aesthetic questions, but it was still not used in the way we today use theory. So what is this quick theory, quick uh, understanding of theory that we have in the literary studies or humanities at large? Uh, when I started my PhD, one of my uh, doctoral committee members who was not, who was actually originally an engineer. Um, so he asked me that in literature, why is it that you think that philosophy started in 1966? Because when we were in masters, we were taught a particular series of literary theories beginning mostly with the, that famous conference uh, in Johns Hopkins University where Jacques Derrida presented a seminal paper called uh, Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of Human Sciences uh, in 1966. Now that was seen as a turning point in literary theory from the older structuralist domain to what now came to be known as post-structuralist. Although it took another good 10 years before Gayatri Svivak's book a uh, translation of Derrida's book came out, and which is when it actually uh, spread in the English speaking academia of USA and then slowly into other parts. In India, it came probably towards the end of 80s when, uh, and the 80s were also a very unique time because the, I mean, the one of the things which helped propel theory in departments was funding during the Cold War. So some of the faculty here may, may know that in the in Hyderabad, there was a very well-known center called American Studies Research Center, ASRC. And it was funded all through the Cold War till the end of it by the American embassy to basically promote the studies of American, American studies and theory. So it, they, they started area studies centers all over the world. And the discipline of comparative literature particularly came to be closely associated with it. So in 1989, the Berlin Wall falls, and that also sets in motion the collapse or the eventual collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. With the end of Cold War, certain basic ground realities shifted. Since the Soviet was no longer an ideological threat, funding for projects, especially art and cultural projects, which were covertly or overtly funded by the CIA or the American embassy, slowly stopped to a point where the American Studies Research Center, ASRC in Hyderabad, was shut down and eventually the library was handed over to the Osmania University. Today it's called OUCIP, Osmania University um, Center of something, I think Center of International uh, Program or something, OUCIP. Now, this is also interestingly the time, like 1989 is also when the Forum on Contemporary Theory was founded in Baroda which became the most significant center of bringing in scholars of basically Western theoretical studies in India. So this center was initially based out of MS University Baroda and started by Professor Prafullakar. Now this center was instrumental in bringing in people like Spivak, Bhava, name, name any of the big names in the heydays of theory, of, of basically postmodern theory. Now it started in 18, sorry, 1980. And it's still going on, but in the meantime, the center of gravity shifted again because of the geopolitical shifts by the 1990s. Uh, now, here I should pause for a moment and mention that by this time, the word theory with a capital T actually came to mean something even more specific. It meant post structuralist or post modern theory. So, even though with its small t theory would include all other forms like structuralism, psychoanalysis, feminism, uh, critical race studies and, uh, and the recent ones. The one with the capital T then has had come to mean only post-structuralist theory. And by the 90s, it had come to resemble a very obscure set of um, texts, articles and books um, that were almost indecipherable. 
there were many uh, culprits in this uh, in this domain homi baba was one of them his location of culture being notoriously difficult to decipher uh, judith butler came under fire as well many other scholars who were writing began or rather thrived they delighted in deploying a prose that took extreme amounts of difficulty to unpack now the the direct outcome of course in every scholarly discipline there is a reason why we have a necessity for jargon to some extent we need a register so that we do not do not have to explain every single word that is fine but if but when the people within the discipline are struggling to communicate with each other then there is a problem as i the cartoon that i read out at the beginning from calvin and hobbes clearly all those words if i just quickly go back the words are not unfamiliar the dynamics of interbeing and monological imperatives in dickens jane a study in psychic trans relational gender modes but clearly we do not need to make it so obscure that we have to break our head trying to understand what it exactly means and this mockery that is being made here sort of exploded in the public domain in 1996 when a new york university physicist by the name of alan sokol published a article in a major social in a major journal called social text the journal uh, the article was titled transgressing the boundaries towards a hermit transformative hermeneutics of quantum gravity wonderful title very heavy has all the you know ticks all the boxes transgressing boundaries has a radical element to it transformative it mentions hermeneutics and quantum gravity it also brings in the scientific rigor to it the paper went through the back then i don't think they had the double bind peer blind peer process but it went through whatever they had the paper was published the paper actually argued if you read through it carefully that this quantum gravity is a linguistic construct it's a linguistic constructs are very favorite i mean they are our favorites in the humanities departments of course constructs do exist as conceptual apparatuses we need them but to say that gravity is a linguistic construct is to extend the idea of ludwig wittgenstein who had earlier said that the limits of my language are the limits of my world thereby making a logical statement that there are things which would be linguistically beyond my grasp i cannot understand it and therefore probably that's the limit of my world that is an argument with a degree of validity but to stretch it to an extreme and say that gravity is a linguistic construct therefore is to move into a terrain where i'm now trying to define physical laws not just cultural laws or linguistic laws the laws of physics as constructed by language now the argument is absurd of course um, i don't think anyone here would like to defend that gravity doesn't exist outside our linguistic uh, understanding of it but the question then is how did this paper get published why didn't anyone notice and it, this was a major journal and ironically this particular issue in which it came out was called science wars in which many humanists were up against the scientists trying to argue that even science is a particular discourse so i think a 10 days after this article was published alan sokol went on another journal called lingua franca and he revealed that this article was meant as a spoof he just wanted to use the trending topics terms jargon that are that, that were pro proliferating in humanities and see how literature professors react to it now once this spoof was revealed it led to a major hue and cry it was a scandal because it meant several things one of which was our jargon has the capacity to become so obscure that even the scholars in the field can no longer tell what is a serious argument and what is a spoof that of course was a serious setback to take it further alan sokol went on 
to publish a book called Imposter Intellectual, which means intellectual impost impostures um, in 1997. And he looked at most of the theorists and more, many of them were French, the French theorists. So Gilles Deleuze, Luz Irigere, and the others. And he looks at their published writing and he finds another degree of abuse that is evident in the theoretical jargon. And that is because of reasons perhaps partially understood by us, there is a clamor for rigor. There is a concern that the humanities or the literary studies are not rigorous enough. And therefore, we need to give it a sense of scientific rigor. So what happened here was someone like Luz Erigere would then go on to argue that the speed of light, that is the, the constant number used for all calculations, used in physics actually reflects masculine dominance. Now, several other such arguments came out of its context and then given a particular narrative or ideological shape. Little uh, pausing to wonder how it may be justified. Now, once this whole you know, can of worms opened up, uh, there was no stopping it. A uh, lot of people took up the cudgels to defend theory. Many people were delighted that they always were unhappy with the dominance of theories in the 70s, in the 80s, early 90s. And they were happy, wonderfully happy to see it wither and die. So if this was happening in the West, what was happening in India? Now, the, the other thing I didn't mention was 2008, there was another major event, particularly in the West, where there was a bank collapse, uh, several banks collapsed, and there was a financial crisis and a recession. What this did to the Western academia was funding for literature departments dried up. The In the heydays of theory from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, there was a lot of funding available. PhD scholars who would graduate in literature theory, they they were readily absorbed in the system as faculty. And I'm talking about the US particularly here. By 2008, it had already started building. And after 2008, the whole system just collapsed. So the number of PhD graduates in this disciplines probably remained uh, to similar levels for another 10 years. But the hiring process just completely disappeared. So now this has implications for what or rather, the, or in other words, if I can use a metaphor here, the pie was shrinking, it was getting smaller every day. And although ironically, the US was one of the first major economies to recover from the financial crisis, it never back that funding into the humanities. What was taken was gone forever. And in the last 20 years, when you when they track the enrollment in different disciplines in the US, divided by management, STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, management. Uh, English has fallen to probably a tenth of what it was. Probably not a tenth. I, I'm probably mistaken here, but uh, significantly less. I need to check this. So probably 10 percent, if I'm not wrong. So what it means is fewer students are willing to graduate in a discipline which is now seen in perpetual crisis. What do you do with a PhD? In a discipline which is not going to get you jobs, you are you industry ready? Are you are you aware of the latest you know, steps in the, the world of theory? Now, with the pie getting smaller, uh, other sub disciplines sprang up. So, for instance, instead of a, a centralized English departments, now there was a demand for let's say uh, African American studies, uh, gender studies, and other other disciplines. Cultural studies was one of the earliest. So. This splintering of Christ mandatory for incoming PhD scholars and graduates to seek out these in theories. I mean, why would a PhD scholar who's otherwise a smart student not see the problem that you're beginning with the theory? That's simply because the realities around us have changed so rapidly that they understand that to enhance my personal chances of professional success, I have to figure out 
what my areas of focus are what am i specializing in and these necessities are now driving the uh, these abuses of theory now coming to india there are particularly two or three aspects that are very obvious to us uh, but before i go to those i'd mention one more thing that we need as indians most of us i believe are indians here as indians we need to keep in mind that in the economic trajectory india's growth or the economic gdp is at a very different place than in the west so unlike in the west where funding is drying up and where economies are hardly growing entering recession in germany in japan um, india is set to grow india is set to grow for another three decades at least if not longer the proportion might change that is not the point but there is a lot of funding that is available so the the ground realities are not exactly the same but then the question is aren't we also pushing for stem education the corollary would be isn't stem education necessary of course it is so nobody is denying the necessity of stem and other i mean engineering and management but what is then going to be the future of literary studies and how is theory at the heart of it so keeping that in mind the different realities of india as opposed to the west um one of the things that we have the opportunity of is we still have students who are keen to study literature perhaps uh, not as many as in the as 50 years back but they're still there and if funding is made available it might even go up in the future so why can't we ask ourselves these basic questions of what what do i mean by theory what am i using what am i abusing and how not to do it so the question of jargon prose that's a different question and has to be dealt with separately obscure language of course has to be dealt with separately but what we can look at is expand the focus of our work and one of the perhaps results of a colonial hangover perhaps a direct outcome of colonialism is we are still seen as a primary a post colonial world so most friends i have who went to the us or did their phd in the us would end up focusing on south asia and most likely on post colonial theory and that was a trend uh, for a, quite a while in fact i remember there's a major historian called sanjay subramanyam who currently teaches in uh, university of california in irvine he founded a sub discipline of history called connected histories which is quite uh, re- well you know well regarded in the academia western academia as well i was i had a discussion with a dutch historian and he said oh yeah sanjay subramanyam he's a post colonial scholar now if you actually read sanjay subramanyam he has absolutely no nothing to do with post colonialism as a theory but he does come from a country which is seen as post colonial and by virtue of that all scholars from south asia are supposed to be interested in post colonialism what does it mean for the scholarship it means that the scope of research that is often seen as valid or allowed for south asians is reduced to uh let's say a particular content so if i'm looking at a literary text if you are looking at shakespeare if you are looking at any major western uh, writer we are not just looking at the text for content i'm not going to read hamlet just to take out the synopsis or the plot line and then you know use a theory and write a paper that's not how traditionally you approach you can of course do that but as a complement to the existing uh, scholarship but south asian texts risk being reduced primarily into content they're not the form just disappears question longer seen a relevant question or perhaps slightly there is an understanding that these texts are not rich enough to support a aesthetic or poetic analysis uh, here is a article that came out in 2019 by harvard a uh, literary scholar vidyan ravindran ravindran and it was published in new literary history 
he says indian verse and the question of aesthetics and he goes on to look at this particular question why is it that criticism of any of being a full fledged literary text um, so this of course is one of the problems the the disappearance of aesthetics or poetic concerns from literature the question of pleasure and pleasure, question of joy automatically disappears we no longer re, no, look at novels as sources of entertainment sources of let's say uh, a good company a book can be a good company what it then is reduced to is what is the plot line and how can i produce a paper out of it and then it is no longer i mean if you ask an author the first question an author will tell you is i want to know or rather a reader would like to know is is this book any good that is not the question that even features anymore in these discussions so what is the other problem of course both are important but without political understanding it will be a very naive understanding of texts but there is also a related concern therefore of reducing the uh, question into uh, theory and data is there a question can i ask a question here Certainly, this yeah. is from, uh, how do you where do you put liberal studies so to say in this entire uh, um, dialectic where would you put liberal studies that's the and it it in a way you know it takes any text and makes an aesthetics of it as well and at the same time you know, it's very uh, uh, theory bound as well so how would you put uh, or where would you put liberal studies what do you mean by liberal studies liberal studies is if you know they include uh, practically everything under the sun when it comes to the syllabus so to say take look up the liberal studies syllabus of any university and liberal, it has, art, liberal arts programs uh, they are called liberal arts in okay now studies liberal arts yes i mean many universities um arts programs it's called liberal arts. yeah i can give you any number of examples how would you look at the entire phenomenon uh, so, are you from a liberal studies department? Uh, not directly. I am in the English department, but around me, I have many universities uh, which yeah. have, you know, such a combination. Too. Can we just name Sorry? one for reference? No, I wouldn't like to. I mean, uh, it's better that we discuss it as it is. No, no. I mean, since we seem to have yeah. a. Yeah. No, no, I'm just trying to uh, place it because I don't remember seeing liberal studies as a department. So I'm just trying to place it. Uh, I'm sure there might, might if I mention there might be, there must be. So uh, because uh, how you name a department also comes into the picture. I think. I know. I know. I know that. Especially I'm asking you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, hmm. Right. No, but I mean I cannot respond to the liberal studies thing because I'm not because it could also mean a political science program. That's what I was trying to ask. Because liberal studies could also be something that includes other things. I mean, it could be an interdisciplinary program that uh, yeah, perhaps... These are both ways, like, you know, they are interdisciplinary in a way, but at the same time, you know, they do include quite a bit of literature as well. I see. Okay. I mean, I'd have to look it up to uh, give you a specific answer because, uh, uh, yeah. But so, respond to liberal arts. Liberal arts, yeah. So what the question is, how do, how do you use theory in liberal arts? Uh, because I believe that liberal arts also, if you look at it, you know, is positing a given theory. Mm. And uh, if you are debating that, how would you put? Uh, liberal arts is not a theory. I mean, the theory must be that the ones they use in the studies. Unless you mean liberalism theory? No, liberal arts, I would of looking at human. Uh, I, oh, okay, uh, we have to be more specific here. Uh, what I understand you mean is a particular uh, outlook towards how syllabuses are framed. 
liberal arts that that's is not one aspect mean, of it that's one aspect of it and when they actually mm -hmm. teach uh, also they would uh, prioritize certain to use a very theoretical term they would prioritize certain things yes exactly. i agree with you sir so uh, uh, when you move from, uh, let's say we look at the theories themselves, that's when the question is, like, let's take something concrete. And that's what I was trying to get at from the start, that often what happens in our discussions is we function at a very abstract level. We're not grounding it in anything concrete, right? So, for example, I can talk about liberal arts or liberalism, liberalism as a political theory, liberalism, perhaps liberal arts as a disciplinary. Yeah, I think someone has commented that it's umbrella term, right? So these are different approaches or um, there's the vision behind a particular program. Uh, that's not, uh, I mean, to answer how to use theory is then basically to say, how do I use it in this department or in this discipline or this program? Because those programs will have multiple things. Like if it has, a, so to have a clear, I mean, for me to answer you clearly, I need to understand what uh, theory you are talking about. Because if you're talking about liberal theory as a liberalism, as a political theory, then that's the question. Are you talking about that? Not about it. I'm. We deal with that also. It's just certain theories which get prioritized. All right. Okay. I would like to uh, gently uh, disagree with you here. Liberal arts is not a theory. Okay. So. Uh, perhaps it's not a theory, but it's not a theory uh, that I know. What I'm trying to suggest is, you know, the way the way becomes a theoretical framework, and that's why it is so very uh, concretely or so very obviously uh, differentiated yeah. from, uh, like, let us say, regular BA or. Okay, let's. Uh, I, I mean, I I don't uh, I completely understand why because any theoretical discussion tends to, let's say enter this you know uh, abstract domain so it won't uh, this discussion will not help unless you concretize it so are you a faculty yes okay fine so you are obviously familiar with preparing your course outline you are very familiar with the approaches so mm -hmm. I'm, i mean I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. uh what i'm saying here is liberal arts not is not that's as i said i have to disagree there liberal arts is not a theory so when we're coming to the approaches that we use, uh, if you have already decided, let's say this is what the syllabus is going to be, that is fine because a syllabus is a closed entity. You are going to teach the students what you know the outcome is and what is the desired outcome for them. Uh, in research, on the other hand, it's the exact opposite. It's not closed, it's open-ended, ideally. So I cannot close it down right at the beginning saying that I'm going to find this at the end of my research. Uh, is, am I making myself clear? I would say that when uh, I design a curriculum or when I design a syllabus, uh, though there is a difference between curriculum and uh, syllabus, mm -hmm. if I already say that I'm going to look at it from a particular framework right. called liberal arts, I am imposing a theory on syllabus design itself. Mm -hmm. And are we taking that into consideration at all? The question is asked. Uh, I that. don't advise it. I wouldn't say that because designing a syllabus, as I said, is a different question. We're today here, we're not talking about that. That is a I thought. Know. Hmm. I know, but what I'm trying to say is if that is going to be the major concern right now, can hmm. we just hmm. talk about what happens in the PhD level, what happens at the MPhil level, if we are not addressing it right at this basic because my, yeah, because my students are later on going to go for MPhil PhD, you know, when they're already going there, reaching there via this liberal study stuff, then shouldn't I be uh, opening up that, to use once again a very theory term, opening it up at the basic level? Even when I know that, uh, I understand what happens at the MPhil PhD level, but I'm trying to suggest that I need to open up this basic framework, because in this bas very basic framework of syllabus design, curriculum design, you know, there is a... And, Indistinct or how uh, we something that is not very. Uh, really... uh, just uh, to, to, you know, like otherwise this will go on. 
Uh, please give me an example. Give me an example of the theory that you are teaching the students and how you are teaching it. Uh, Take any theory. How should, how should when I, uh, I think uh, my question has not registered. I'm trying to suggest that the very domain called sort of liberal arts, arts or liberal studies as well, in sort of, you know, has a inbuilt theoretical and That's we cannot saying, just talk about it's you know, a, it's a as someone mentioned it's an umbrella term it's not a theoretical framework what it effectively does is it opens you up to multiple perspectives so the the if you want a term it will be methodological pluralism that is the framework that within the liberal arts program i will be exposing my students to not one but multiple theories and that is the idea okay so uh, I no, think Mr. We'll... Sharma, I'm absolutely sure of what I'm talking about. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll just take your uh, comment here and I have to move on. Okay. Okay, fine. That's okay. I'll just. Fine. All right. Now, um, uh, okay. Now, coming back to the question of aesthetics and politics. So, one of the lacunae that often we find in the research is this re reduction of the whole novel, let's say, or a movie into its summary. So, with almost little regard for the question of form, therefore. Now, in recent, recent years, uh, Caroline Levin, who teaches in the university of currently, I believe in uh, Cornell University. Um, so she came out, with the, came out with the book called Forms, F-O-R-M-S. And she reframed the way we have understood forms for the last maybe 50 years and how it has changed from the times of Russian formalism in the early 20th century. So th this then leads to the question as to, of I think what one scholar said that, okay, that um, theory often comes from to data. And I would like to repeat this one more time. Theory often comes from elsewhere and India is reduced to data. Now this is another problem of the way scholars use theories within our you know indian academia so it then creates a hierarchy where we're not questioning the theories at all it's like if i start with a theoretical framework then i have already established an acceptance that this is the theory this is my argument the argument is already set in stone now i'm going to look for texts to find evidence for supporting my claims and therefore, it is very unlikely then that I'll go on to question the theory itself. Does this particular theory work in Indian context? Or if not an Indian context, in the specific context of, let's say, a particular city or, or a state or a linguistic domain. So how do I then handle the problem of not reducing India into data? Do we have inherent in or other, is there available in India where we are trying to theorize and um, actually contribute it. So the, the, the distinction is unfortunate because by accepting as a theoretical framework completely as it is, we give up the intellectual um, ground. We sort of, uh, we have already rel relinquished it. And it has consequences. For example, a friend of mine was during his PhD was contacted by a German scholar. And the German scholar wanted him to collect data. So he had funding for some project. He wanted data in, I think, uh, in Bengal area. And all he needed was someone to do the legwork. He was not interested in what views my friend had, even though he was a, you know, an Indian and perhaps with insights into the con concerns that might be useful to him. But the idea was that because the theoretical framework is already set, so we already understand, we already know what is going to happen or what is already happening. I just need data to prove it. And that harms or hurts the research process. Um, now other than uh, Dr. Pratima, anyone else who has any questions or any clarifications you see at this point about the question of this uh, India being reduced to data and not questioning or critiquing theory or the question of, um, let's say, how poetics and aesthetics are they are sidelined in pursuit of the content of the text. Any questions, please just raise your hand. Okay. The other point, 
which then comes to the question of abusing theory or misuse of theory is often an ironic lack of reflexivity which is which was um, um which is now very common like these days you cannot enter uh, most research domains without being questioned as in what are your privileges uh, where are you coming from but for instance in the 1980s and 90s when theory was entering here it took some Alton studies and many major indian scholars were part of it nothing wrong with it they all uh, they made significant contributions a lot of the work is still useful ironically though it had a blind spot which was all these scholars tended to be from a particular background caste class whatever so the dr pratima i mean uh, please do ask questions i mean i am not trying to uh, suggest that your question is valid i think just just some miscommunication um you probably mean by liberal arts we can probably discuss that later i'm not discouraging anybody that is not the intention okay so um, then it comes into the question of reflexivity therefore what happened was even before let's say now a lot of focus is there on critical race studies and through that um, i mean india we look at questions of dalit studies and and uh, for example queer theory has come up um, so the question of reflexivity is now central to the scholars pursuit and all these questions are therefore contributing to a kind of research which if i if i go back to the first case that i gave you in most cases the moment a student comes to you and says i want to work on this or this is my theory in almost every case you would be able to probably predict to a large degree of accuracy what the outcome of the research is going to be now i would like all of you to pause and wonder and think is that really the point of research i mean if i'm able to look at the title if i'm able to look at the the first um, few lines and and probably predict what's going to happen in the next 100 pages 200 pages what exactly is the point of the research and that is where a lot of the gap comes in and is visible so what do we do about it and particularly in india because of the geopolitical concerns and also because um, you know we are in a different trajectory um just a second yeah um so how do we use it so here i would uh, like to recall uh, the famous words by susan sontag who said in 1964 in a book called against interpretation that interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon art interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon art and that is something which made me wonder as to what happens when we bring in a piece of an artwork let's say a, a painting a novel or something else that is meant to be artwork into our academic domain for a critical analysis of course when the so called uh, the high days of theory you know the hermeneutics of suspicion as it was called is significantly useful we need to be suspicious to to ask questions especially against the uh, norm but what exactly are we achieving here if high theory is no longer the currency in academia as is the case now theory does continue to proliferate i had spent some time looking at the question of death of theory so what does it mean that you know there was a lot of many books came out death of theory theory after theory uh, life after theory uh, terry eagleton had one after theory so what exactly was going on why why were people eulogizing it or celebrating it and what does it mean for us is theory really dead i mean we don't see that i mean are looking around us do we really believe theory is dead that's not that doesn't seem to be our experience so what has happened appears to be that high theory or what is understood as theory with a capital t is no longer at the center and we probably no longer force our students to go through structure sign and play by their either although we had to study it when i was in masters so perhaps the texts prescribed and we just had a brief discussion as to syllabus framing um the if you can use the word canon in a more loose term perhaps that that canon of theory is evolving but what is emerging in its place i mean we have mentioned queer theory gender studies is already there um for, for the last few years especially 
because of events in the US, uh, critical black studies or critical race studies have become very dominant. So new kinds of frameworks keep emerging. So theory does proliferate, but what then is not always happening is the centrality of the text in the study. So without a concrete example, if I don't mention, for example, which book I'm looking at, or you know, when, when, I, when I'm uh, avoiding concretizing my arguments in anything, any concrete example, I run the risk of floating in the air. And that therefore would also impede my confidence in critiquing a theory that I'm taking as gospel. That, okay, this theory is already going to explain my life experience. So we, there is a need for seeking out fresh frameworks, perhaps alternative frameworks that exist. Um, there were some studies that I saw, interestingly enough, they were using Indian aesthetic theories to study foreign texts. Now, of course, uh, you can also use foreign theories to study Indian texts. Why not? I mean, anything that gives you a new insight is welcome. But the idea is it should not be reduced to a cliche. And more importantly, should not reduce the literary text into data. And uh, these are what uh, some of the things that I had to uh, share. Now, I have a quick um, uh, you know, assignment, not an assignment, but a quick, uh, let's say, an activity. There's an image here by a French painter called René Magritte. And there is a pipe. And it says, Ceci n'est pas une pipe. This is not a pipe. So it's just a fun activity. I would like you to click on the, uh, is it uh, clickable? Uh, probably not. Uh, I'll just share it on, on comments. Please click on it and just write maybe a few words about what you think it is. You can use any theory that you want. Just briefly, not too long. Um, let me just post the link. Sir, may I ask you a question? I have a doubt. Certainly. Um, when you were talking about how uh, we are reducing theory uh, to data, I have a question that really bothers me most of the time, that even if you wish to really look into and come out with a new theory and challenge what is absolutely put as a theory, I think the knowledge of one field will not really help you. And you should at least at some point of time must borrow theories, as you said, right? Uh, um, some time ago that we have to borrow and we have to experiment and come out with new. Do you think that the kind of an education that is offered to us really gives us that space to really get ourselves connected to several uh, domain, other domains and come out with something new, challenging, or maybe something subverting, or maybe something absolutely new? Because as a researcher too, uh, being in literature, I have a problem of really doing a quantitative research because I'm not good with numbers. Uh, so I have no other chance but to stick only to a qualitative research. So when there are impediments like this in the very pedagogical understanding that we have, do you think it's really possible for us to experiment and come up with something new? Or at least should we have, can we really have such kind of a mind? We can really do something about it? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, because you are actually hitting the nail on its head. I mean, if you have identified certain issues, now the question is what do we do about it? So. Uh, to answer your first question directly, I think that as a whole, India has the educational infrastructure in place to equip students to do all of these things. But again, mentioning the third point I had about reflexivity, it is also the fact that there is a hierarchy of in institutes and some institutes are better equipped than, than others. So perhaps uh, these days, uh, some of the private institutes are coming up um, who are you know, who have lavish funding. They're bringing faculty from abroad. Uh, might They might be able to create that space. Some of the old, very good public universities as well. I mean, Delhi University is still good. It used to be good. It's still good. So uh, there are many such universities. So, uh, But not definitely not the majority. And it would definitely not be feasible if we demand of all scholars that they come up with original critiques or especially venturing into other disciplines. That is the danger zone. And when Alan Sokol was attacking um, social, humanities and social science uh, scholars, his criticism was that many of these theorists are misusing theory, as in like they are taking the 
the idea from this domain, wrenching it out of context, and effectively not able, the cause effect sequence is not there. It's not justifiable. So the arguments don't follow, and uh, so the, the danger is there. I think the the fact that we are all discussing it and uh, thinking about it, we can perhaps introduce some minor changes in the, in the beginning. So we we'll probably say that uh, we could encourage students and scholars to avoid starting with the theory. You know, start with the text. That's one simple step, but it does completely reorient the focus. Uh, of course, you need theory, but it should come after. Um, we can perhaps as and for as for those of us who are faculty, we might perhaps try to see if we are, um, you know, if we have the, uh, let's say, the privilege of having access to certain uh, things, we should probably try to uh, at least ask ourselves that I'm using this theory. If I'm using critical race theory, um, can I adapt it in certain ways? Or sometimes, let's say, I'm using a Foucauldian idea, and it seems to explain some certain things. Can I still ask that where is it not fitting? That's all. You know, we take, we accept what is working, and then probably go into what is not. And during my MPhil, I was looking at uh, Foucault's um, theory on erotica, basically his uh, idea of sexuality, and he seemed to have divided the entire literature in the world into two parts: the arts erotica and scientia sexualis, which is to say that science existed only in the West, and uh, the East only had art, and to me, it was quite clear that that is a, of course, all generalizations have a, an element of truth, but he did not make the allowance for all the other aspects where um, scientific thinking or at least rigorous logical thinking could also exist along with the art. So this sort of you know, mono, um, like a reducing a text into uh, you know, one dimension rather, um, stripping it of its politics sometimes, stripping it of its aesthetic sometimes, whatever the, the the error may be so um so yeah so no we don't we don't really have the wherewithal to address the issues at large at the moment but there is always hope that perhaps uh, um you know in the near future perhaps in 10 years from now things might change so but we, at, we can start doing certain things and one is is to probably ask ourselves that we should never make claims without evidence you know, like um, I'm making a theoretical claim. Here is the evidence. So um, for I'm just posting that uh, not this is not a feedback form. This is the um, the activity I had shared about the image. Uh, please, I'm, I'm sure you're all anxious to fill up the feedback form. Please do uh, take a minute to write a few words. I'm just curious to uh, read it. Now you can look at the image. It's a pipe, and it says this is not a pipe. So you could probably look at it and. Uh, you know, you can draw from any theory you want, perhaps psychoanalysis, why not? Or whatever else we want. So, um, uh, is the link not working, the one that I shared? It's working, yeah. 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 Uh, Is it Ashwarya Venkat? Is the link not working? It's working, sir. It's, it's working, okay. All right. Yeah, please do take a minute, and it's a and it's a wonderful, uh, you know, like a very well-known painting. So I mean, I think Foucault wrote an entire booklet trying to understand what this painting meant. Layers and layers of meaning could be deduced from it. It also reminds me of Susan Zontag. You know, the interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon art. <laughs> 